Just ahead on Black Issues Forum, a special look at the legacy of Muhammad Ali and what he was fighting for outside of the ring. Stay with us. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. This year, Ken Burns released an eight hour documentary series on PBS about the heavyweight boxing legend Muhammad Ali. There were numerous facets of the champ's life, but today we're going to examine his influence as a social justice warrior through the eyes of some North Carolina champions for equality. In a moment, we'll meet our panel, but first, this North Carolinian shares how he is fighting to empower communities through economic self sufficiency. I am Lavelle Moten, head men's basketball coach at North Carolina Central University. There wasn't a lot of people that looked like me in the early 80s on TV that was a true representation of me. All of a sudden, I see this guy, he's bold, he's brash, he's confident, and it instantly just resonated with myself and my brother, and I just became a fan. I asked my mom for, at Christmas to get me the Everlast boxing suit because I wanted to be like Muhammad Ali. I heard him talk about how great he was, but I also heard him talk about how great he wanted his people to be. And that meant a lot to me. That let me know that he was thinking about those in situations such as myself. When we hear this cliche of the GOAT, right, and they use it so casually, that term was really a direct correlation to him, indicating the greatest of all time. And that's why I believe he's the greatest of all time. He stood up for us when there wasn't a lot of sacrifices being made on our behalf. He did it during a time where the world was really, really segregated. And black people were looking for leadership. And it was unpopular at that particular time because all of our leaders was killed. The Mega Evans, the Martin Luther Kings, the Malcolm X's. Ali gave it all up, right? His livelihood, his wife, his kids, and said, look, I'm standing firm and convicted in my beliefs. We'll go find another way, but I'm not gonna go back in that boxing ring and I'm not going to fight anybody else's war. Outside of being a great champion and having love for self and raising your self-esteem level, what he taught me is that life is just really a real life Monopoly board game. In order to win, you gotta have a seat at the table. And the goal is to own the, the homes, the property, the land, the utilities, the water, the electric, the gas. That's the goal because you accumulate wealth. My friends and I, my childhood friends and I, we started a construction development company called Riley Ray's Development. So what we've done in certain Raleigh neighborhoods, including my own former neighborhood, uh, Lane Street, is we went back in and we're gonna redevelop and build the affordable housing. You know, I come from unfortunate situations. I, I was labeled an outcast. I'm, I'm from the have-nots. I know what it's like for society to throw you a curveball and wonder where your next meal is coming from. And so I always had this dream and said to myself, if and when I ever make it out of these circumstances, I'm going to come back and have tangible programs in place to help these people because I understand their challenges and difficulties. I'm fighting for my family. I'm fighting for my kids. I'm fighting for my community, I'm fighting for my neighborhood, I'm fighting for my people, I'm fighting for my team, I'm fighting for my school, I'm fighting for my single mothers, I'm fighting for the marginalized and disenfranchised kids, I'm fighting for the voiceless, I'm the voice of the people, I guess I'm the people's champ <laughs> in a way. Right now, joining us to talk about how athletes can use their platforms to fight for justice and help empower communities, I want to welcome Errol Reese, co-host of the Sports Shop Radio Show, and Dr. Aaron Moore, executive director of the Center for Racial and Social Justice at Shaw University. Errol, you know, we listened to Coach Moten, and one of the things that he talks about is how no one gave it up like Ali did. You know, what are your thoughts on what athletes today are giving up for social justice? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. They're giving up a lot. You'll be surprised. I think that there's a vast majority of people, particularly athletes, that are making a sacrifice. My only issue with them was particularly uh, a few months ago, during COVID and the protests and, and coming out and being out front is that let's, and I use uh, the metaphor, let's, uh, let's, 
let's make sure, I want you to take that hill, but let's make sure we understand what hill you're taking. In other words, if we're marching, we're, if, we're, if we're coming out front, uh, really being really, uh, really vocal about what's going on, let's make sure we understand what it's all about. Everybody's fighting for something. Yeah. And uh, Aaron, you know, at Shaw University, that is the home of the uh, largest civil rights movement forwarded by students uh, that we know of, of our time. Mm -hmm. And so it's really appropriate that we, that we have you here to represent the center. But can you share some of the um, challenges that students face today in trying to achieve social justice for themselves um, as opposed to what the kids were facing back during uh, Ali's time? Well, thank you again for having me here, and I'm, I'm proud to, to be a part of Shaw University's historic legacy. And I think, um, even though we may think that the times are different and the situation's different, what the students were fighting for in the 1960s, what Ali was fighting for, and what our students today are fighting for is the right to exist. It's the right to be themselves unapologetically. Ali said that I'm going to be a Muslim, I'm going to worship the way I'm going to worship, I'm going to fight and stand for my beliefs, and either you're going to accept me or you're not going to accept me. And I think what we're seeing right now with young people today, sadly, we've had to have the cry, Black Lives Matter. We've had to say that, yes, we matter, we have the right to exist. We're fighting so that we don't get killed and gunned down by the police. We're fighting to end uh, gun violence in our communities and in our schools. And on a deeper level, we're fighting for an existential right to exist as human beings. You know, we're facing this, you know, very serious climate crisis. And the young people today are fighting for their future and the future of their children and for their families. So existence and the, the freedom and the right to exist in your own skin, the way that the Creator has made you, the way for, for you to live a full life, that's a universal struggle, and that's a struggle that, and sadly, um, we're still having to fight. So the question is, uh, why are people sacrificing why they don't? I mentioned there are plenty of uh, athletes that are sacrificing, but when you look at the ones that don't, they do it for various reasons. One is that they'll try and protect their brand in terms of, uh, if I be out front, if I go hard this way, I may lose some financial support. I may, may lose some endorsements, particularly athletes uh, at the professional level. If you go one sub bullet below that one, particularly with the, uh, with the white athletes, they have a whole different kind of circumstances. Yeah, they have the, the threat of endorsements, the threat of uh, losing money, but they have this thing called family and friends because they obviously, some of them, not all of them, they uh, were, were raised in a, an environment of entitlement and privilege uh, as a birthright, if you will. And they may, go, they may go against that because if you're out fighting for you know, social uh, injustice and racial equality and all those buzzwords that, that we fight for each and every day, they may have a hard time with a conversation at the dinner table, particularly around Thanksgiving, because they're not, they, were, they wasn't raised that way. My, my, my thought is this, though, whether you're an athlete, whether you're a talk show host, radio host, TV host, or whatever, that collectively, if you can understand what it means to be pulled over, to be redlined, if you will, <laughs> what it means to be treated like not a human, you would clearly understand why we fight for what we fight for each and every day. We also sat down with a coach who is making a name for the softball program at Duke University, which won the 2021 ACC championship. She talks about her work for equality for young women in sports and beyond. I am Marissa Young, and my players know me as Coach Young. I'm the head softball coach at Duke. I would describe myself as a, a really hard worker, and I'm a mother of four, and at work a mother of 25, and I just am blessed to be able to coach and mentor young women in the prime of their life uh, through the game of softball. The opportunities that we have these days and the platform that it has provided us to um, fight other causes and journeys has been tremendous. I think Muhammad Ali was the greatest because he was not only a tremendous competitor in the boxing ring, but he had a huge impact on the community outside and, and globally um, as a humanitarian. All my life I saw him as the greatest in, in the boxing ring, and um, it's been a pleasure to get to know what his life what meant outside of that ring, the impact that he's had on so many people in his community and also globally. 
His confidence and, and persona was incredible. You know, there was no, no one like him. And his, his confidence was something that I admired and, and wanted my players to, to still take with them as they take the field of really believing that you're great. And I think as women, sometimes we struggle to do that. I think that we're so quick to see our shortcomings, um, to be super critical of ourselves, or to feel that we can't speak about what we do well because we're not being humble. The game of softball is incredibly fast paced and I think anybody that watches it loves it immediately because of the pace and the energy that these women bring to the game. You do have to have that fight in you, that confidence, that go-getter mentality because you're gonna fail um, seven out of 10 times in your at bats and to have that mental toughness to keep going up there and believing that you're gonna get it that next time is huge. So we work really hard to develop that resilience in our women. I am so proud of, of our young athletes. I think that with everything that's gone on in the world um, the last couple of years, it has really provided the opportunity for them to now have the, the freedom and the platform to speak out about those things. Uh, I feel like as an athlete in, in my time, it was hush hush and you had to deal with those things in silence. In May, I took my team to Muhammad Ali's museum in, in Louisville. We were in Louisville for the ACC tournament, and again, with everything that's gone on in the country, we've been working really hard as a team to not just have that be a one-time conversation, but to keep that at the forefront. At a young age, hearing about how he stood his ground with um, not enlisting in the Army was huge. No, I will not go 10,000 miles to uh, help or kill innocent people. And being able to go to the museum with the team this year was really nice to be able to wrap his whole life together to see how um, you know his lifetime progressed through the Olympics and, and into his later years. I'm fighting for women, particularly opportunities for women of color and those from lower socioeconomic status so that they can have opportunities at Duke that I know will change not only their future but hopefully future generations. Erin, I want to ask you, you know, we have women athletes now who are making a name for themselves, and uh, Coach Young talks about her efforts to really, you know, boost the confidence um, and esteem and just, you know, empower uh, young women athletes. Do you think that they have um, the same kind of leverage as male athletes to um, uh, push for social justice and use their platforms? Uh, to make demands. Um, absolutely. I think what we've seen from female athletes these last uh, four or five years has been incredible. They have really taken stands in many ways in which male athletes have not. Uh, in the WNBA in particular, we've had uh, several of the uh, basketball players forego their career, forego for a season, forego their contracts, um, even some sponsorships to fight for social justice. You have Maya Moore who gave up a season to fight. Uh, to, for the release of a young of a young man that she believed was wrongly convicted, you have a Natasha Cloud who gave up a year to work in social justice, and she was concerned. She was one of the first female athletes to get a, co a contract with Converse. And what Converse did in, in terms of admiring what she did, they said, "We're going to continue to pay your WNBA salary, even though you're not going to be playing this year." So she took that risk, you know, very much in the same way that Muhammad Ali took that risk in term, of terms of forfeiting opportunities for wealth and to make money. She's like, "This is important. We have to stand up for social justice." And then we look at what the Atlanta Dream did um, in terms of fighting against their own particular owner who said, I don't support Black Lives Matter. Um, they felt that some of her actions were reprehensible, and they stood up and tried to encourage people to vote, and they began to be politically active and engaged in the Georgia election. And many people believe that they helped sway uh, the con congressional election towards Raphael Warnock, who was their owner's opponent. Um, and those are just women in the WNBA. We've seen women in soccer the United States women's soccer team fight for equal pay, uh, which is very interesting. These are women who've won consistently the last 10 years or so, whereas the men's soccer team has not. So in America, when we talk about we're going to reward performance, it's glaring to see women who have performed, who have met the standard, not only not get paid, but don't get the bonuses, where the men were still getting a higher salary even though they weren't performing. We're seeing um, women in tennis and gymnastics fighting for mental health. So female athletes, and this is just in recent years, consistently have been fighting for social justice, not only for themselves and for other players, but for society at large. So yes, they're absolutely leveraging their power very much present in that space. Errol, what do you think? You know, how about the power and influence of women athletes today? 
Oh, absolutely. It's significant. Uh, my colleague mentioned so many people. <laughs> I mean, the, the list is so long. I, I got to short my list just a little bit. But I would add to that, when you look at uh, leaders, particularly in sports, uh, women, they are leading men. We can look at uh, Michelle Roberts, who is the executive director of the National Basketball Association mm -hmm. Players Association. Uh, first in the history of that organization. And she's leading uh, Swin Cash, who is the vice president of operations for the New Orleans Pelicans. And the list goes on. Several assistant coaches are now in the NBA coaching men. So if we, we can look, look at it from that perspective, oh, we, it, we have advanced significantly in that space. A lot more work is left to be done. I, I really admire the, the people that my colleague mentioned, like Megan Rapino, people like that. And, of course, uh, Naomi Osaka and Serena Williams, the whole list. But I'll be remiss if I don't mention a local uh, individual that I collaborate with all the time who is a former Virginia uh, Cavalier point guard. She is on the forefront leading this effort around every aspect of women, uh, leadership, and sports, social justice. That's Dr. Deborah Strowman of UNC Chapel Hill, who is on all platforms, is active every single day, pushing the agenda. So we're we, we going to have to look down the street to see someone that's doing some really great things in this space. And I applaud her for all the work that she's done in this space. Well, women are certainly making their uh, presence known in sports, always have. And, you know, to some degree, there's uh, an invisibility. But we are making those strides. Aaron, um, what would you say are the challenges ahead for women in sports um, in terms of, you know, fighting for that equal pay? I think that's, that's one of the major issues that, that women are facing. Um, the equal pay... Um, access to benefits, access to even profit sharing with, with ownership of the teams, moving into coaching and into ownership, um, but also um, leveraging more issues for social justice, bringing more women into sports, taking some of these sports and making them, in, and making them prof professional sports. Many people didn't think that the WNBA would make it or that they would last, and they have been doing exceptionally well. Um, trying to promote women's soccer. And perhaps even women's softball will become also a professional sport. So just r providing those opportunities for young girls who are growing up in sports to have the opportunity to make a living in sports the same way that men have. So um, what do you think about that, Errol? I mean, I'm, she mentioned the WNBA, and I'm thinking about um, all of the, the, the period of the protest movement and the, the great influence that they indeed did have. Oh, absolutely. She mentioned it. They were out there before a lot of people were. Mm -hmm. uh, but Minnesota, I mean, with Mile Moore and, and her crew, they, they boycotted, they, they did some sit-outs, the sit-ins, if you will. They made sure that their voices were heard. And initially, when it happened, they were frowned upon from a lot of people, mm -hmm. but they didn't stop there. They, they was very really diligent in their effort. And I applaud them. It's really, they were out there even before the NBA guys were. Mm -hmm. And I think they led the way. And that's a great thing, in my opinion. And I'd like to think that Muhammad Ali would be proud of these women. Absolutely. Finally, we met a young man who was a basketball standout in high school and junior college, but has moved into the sports entertainment and management space to make an impact. He shares what he's fighting for, for himself and for those around him. I bet you Dominic Jones. I am an artist, uh, I'm an advocate, for sports and entertainment professionals. Sports has always been like a, like a distraction for me. I grew up in Aberdeen, North Carolina, which today still is a very racially charged place to grow up as a black man. From middle school, the time I wrestled with identity and as early as I can remember wrestling with uh, literacy, be it finance or whatever it was, Basketball helped me. It's, it helped me surround myself with like-minded individuals who may have had the same struggles. And it also helped me to um, understand that, you know, I'm needed in different areas of my life. I didn't get a chance to see Muhammad Ali live. When we would be in school and I would see like highlights of him, of his greatness, how easy it was for him to maneuver in different places, I felt like he was just practicing. And I felt, I found that attractive. I found that to be powerful. Um, and then, like, then I found out there's like one aspect of his life. I think he opened up my, opened up my intellect around the sport. 
My life, my journey in this sports and entertainment realm started after the loss of my daughter. After crying my eyes out for days, something came over me and told me to dedicate my life to something else. What, what I do right now with professional athletes and entertainers is I, create, I help them create their brand. For example, I have a girl right now who's playing basketball in Armenia. We loaded up her Instagram with professional photos. Within a month, she got an interview to go and try out. She made the team, she made the club, sent me a contract. The sport is easy. Now what can you do after and during that that's gonna help feed your, your legacy, your name? Muhammad Ali gave something to us. He gave his life to us. What he gave for me was, hey, you have an opportunity, our veteran, to do something with what you see in this light. You got, and, it's, and it's unlimited. You can be the greatest. Striving to be completely peaceful at all times, I think has helped me get answers and get things much quicker. What I'm fighting for is peace. Errol, let me ask you, are you surprised to hear that this young man is fighting for peace? Well, initially I, I was, but then I thought about it. From the countless times I interview young people, they have a whole sense of uh, awareness. Uh, they want peace, they want equality, they want mental breaks. You know, things that we, we never thought about when we, we were that age. But so much is going around in this world that they are attracted to and have to deal with. It's a whole different uh, paradigm. So I, I get that. So having said that, no, I guess I'm not surprised. That's interesting because, you know, a big conversation kind of bubbled up around, you know, taking a break, taking that mental health break yep. and the fact that, look, real athletes, go take that mental health break. But now we know, look, real athletes honor their health, honor, honor their mental health. Absolutely, and you're often surprised where you see guys who make millions of dollars, whether younger or older guys, they still need that break. And, and, and they're coming forth uh, with it now because it's, it's, it's the thing to talk about. Before, it wasn't the thing to talk about. Aaron, let me ask you, how is the social justice struggle that today's young people are facing kind of the same or different from the civil rights struggle of their grandparents' generations? Well, I think the sad part is, is that the struggle continues. I think we were lulled into complacency in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. We thought that society was progressing toward a certain place of not necessarily equality, but acceptance. And what we're finding now, and I think it's been a shock to the system for quite a few Americans, is that, no, that sense of acceptance is not there. And that you have a whole cadre of people who are willing to do whatever it takes to prevent people from achieving justice, mm. to prevent people from having a quality of life, or just even a basic life. And so when that young man says he wants to talk about peace, I'm not surprised. But the issue that we're facing is that there are people who don't want to have peace with you or who won't have peace with us. Uh, there are people who are willing to resort to violence to achieve their ends. And so the prayer for peace that people have during the holiday se season, his wish for peace, people's advocacy and fighting for peace, for peace is real. Because we're, we're coming into a world, or we're living in a world where people um, don't want you to have that sense of peace or that sense of normalcy. The sense that you don't have that right to just have a normal, everyday life with no problems. And there's so many people who are really trying to prohibit that from happening. And so we applaud this young man and others like him who are looking for different avenues and different ways to achieve that peace or to achieve justice. Because I think um, during the 60s and the 70s, we certainly looked to the political process to do that. We looked for advocacy and voting to do that. And we're finding now that we still have to continue to do that. But I think what this younger generation is doing is also doing that economically, using our capital and our resources to fight for justice, to come to the table with more resources and with a sense of equality to say, look, this is what I'm bringing to the table. I have just as much, if not more, than you. So you're going to have to pay attention to some of my issues and some of my concerns because I have these resources. So I think we're going to have to constantly adapt and look for new ways to, to, to challenge the system and to leverage everything that we have 
about, whether it's through voting, whether it's through advocacy, whether it's through protests, whether it's through economics. We're going to do whatever we need to do to seek justice and to maintain justice. You hit on all cylinders right there. And, you know, one of the things that Muhammad Ali was advocating for was economic independence mm -hmm. and self-sufficiency. Errol, you know, as, um, say, uh, young people like Arvetra are helping people to establish that economic independence and uh, their branding and so forth um, in the sports arena, is that power um, giving them the power to um, influence or break down racial barriers out there, you think? Absolutely. That's a, a great question because, mm -hmm. as we sit now, name, image, and likeness is a real thing, particularly uh, with kids in college, where now they can earn, they can make a living. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you don't have to go to corporate America do that. It could be a restaurant down the street or a mechanic shop down the corner. If they want to invest in you, you can invest in yourself. So now, as opposed to playing your sports, various sports that you're playing, you can uh, make a significant amount of money. And we, we've seen that being played out right now as we speak in some of the larger environments, in some of the, the Power 5 schools, but some of the HBCUs, they're taking advantage of that opportunity as well. So I clearly understand what the branding aspect is. That you're branding yourself, you're your own corporation. Mm -hmm. And I love to see that happening that way. Well, Errol Reese, Dr. Aaron Moore, thank you both for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. I want to thank all of today's guests, and we invite you to engage with us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum or listen at any time on Apple, iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Deborah Holt-Noel. Thanks for watching. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.